everyone, happy Halloween and welcome back to my channel. Remember when I introduced Halloween this year, I said that we were going to have fun. We were going to forget all the bad stuff happening in the world. We were going to explore and learn, and that's exactly what's going to happen in today's video. So this video was actually inspired by a trip I took to Mexico in January of this year. And I was talking to some locals, and I found out that they have this place and it's very creepy, but it has a great backstory. And you all know I love the context, the history, the texture, the folklore, the legends that are passed down from generation to generation. All of that is hugely important to the culture of any community. Unfortunately, I was unable to visit this place in person because where I was was not close to where this place was, but uh, me and a couple people were talking, and I told them what I do, and that I like mysteries and things like that, and they were like, oh, you got to check this place out. But I do vow to one day get there. I promise I will. But anyways, when I went home after leaving Mexico, I did some more research and reading, and I was very, very much intrigued. And this led me to reading about other places around the world, other places that also have, you know, sent a chill down the spine of locals and tourists alike. So this is sort of a compilation video, very much like my Tales from the Everglades video from last Halloween. If you haven't seen it, it was a really great video. I enjoyed making it. A lot of you enjoyed watching it. I'll link it in the description box. And I promise that if you allow me to take you on this journey, you will not regret it. We're going to have fun today and, and be a little bit creeped out at times. Yes, for sure. But before we dive in, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Native. I am always doing the most for Native because I really, really do love their products. And I think that you all can tell I genuinely do enjoy Native's products. Native's deodorants are made with familiar and simple ingredients that you know and love, such as coconut oil and shea butter. They're aluminum-free, paraben-free, cruelty-free, and vegan. They're non-sticky and they dry quickly, which is really great for when you're on the go and you don't have the time to stand around for 10 minutes waiting for your deodorant to dry before you put your shirt on. And with Native's deodorants, all you need is a couple of swipes and you're good to go. Best of all, Native stays on all day with 72-hour protection. So for instance, I shower at night, I put my deodorant on, the next morning I go to the gym, I work out, I come home, and I start my work, whether I'm sweating behind my desk, because nothing is like the sitting behind your desk for eight hours straight sweat. People think you don't sweat when you're sitting behind your desk. You do, and it is the worst kind. Or if I'm sweating in front of these hot recording lights, and after all of that, I still smell a amazing and that's because the deodorants really work and they come in an amazing and wide range of scents that are simple and effective and honestly the best sense of any deodorant I've ever smelled and it really came to me this week when I was smelling their new scents which is Native's Cabin Collection I'm going to talk about that in a minute it's a nostalgic factor for me all of Native's scents remind me of something from like my childhood or a happy memory and and it finally hit me that that's why I love their scents so much let me know in the comments if if you feel the same way something about their scents just brings me back to a good, safe, happy place. Right now, I am all about Native's Cabin Collection because you know I'm an autumn girl through and through. These scents bring all the cozy vibes. Think of the great outdoors with sizzling campfires, apple picking, getting cozy inside and curling up by the fire, hay rides, all the good stuff. Create your own cabin in the woods with Native scents such as wildwood and cardamom, warm cider and cinnamon, toasted marshmallow and vanilla, and cashmere and rain. So for me, warm cider and cinnamon has just taken in the cake and I knew it would because I love cider. I love cinnamon. I love anything spicy and appley smelling. It's so good. I have it in deodorant and the body wash. Amazing. But I do have to give a shout out and honorable mention to citrus and herbal musk. I've been using it a lot lately in the deodorant and body wash. It's very good. It's clean smelling, clean smelling and just fragrant and like herbally and citrusy and it's just amazing. But I also do have the Wildwood and Cardamom and the Cashmere and Rain in the body wash, and they are so good. Once again, these nostalgic scents just bring me back to like this happy, cozy place in my childhood. But Native also offers a plastic-free version of their deodorants, which uses the same great formula but with a more sustainable packaging. And the plastic-free version now comes in a new and improved packaging, which is earth-friendly and 100% plastic-free. Native has 
has more to offer too. You know where I'm going with this. The body wash. The best body wash ever created. The only one I'll ever use. I've been bathing in the warm cider and cinnamon body wash and loving every second of it. Like literally, I'm getting in the bath and I'm using it as a bubble bath. It's so good. They also have great toothpaste. And right now you can check out all of that with the amazing deal. I'm going to let you in on three deodorants would normally be $39. But if you use the link in my description box and my code, Stephanie H25, you'll get them for $26. That's over 33% off. Also, with my code, you can get 20% off any body wash or toothpaste. I always use my own code and I stock up on body wash. You should do the same. Thank you so much to Native for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget, click the link in the description box. Use code Stephanie H25. Stock up on your Native and let's dive into our video today. Right now, you are looking at a picture of a bridge shrouded in fog. This is a liminal space, and the technical definition of a liminal space is the physical space between one destination and the next, which doesn't sound too creepy, unless you don't really know what the next destination is. A liminal space is often used in horror genres because, as journalist Brant Lewis puts it, quote, the presence of liminal spaces can be quite haunting and scary. In simplest terms, the well-known and natural become alien in a way we cannot describe as we try to process their existence." End quote. Sometimes these liminal spaces can be a strangely long and empty hallway, such as in The Shining, or a shopping mall after hours, like in Stranger Things. These are places that should feel completely familiar, but there's something wrong there. You can feel it, even if you can't always pinpoint it. It's the juxtaposition between the known and the unknown smashed together in one place in time. Today, we are talking about three places that should feel familiar to us all. A small town, an amusement park, an island. I'm sure at one point or another, we've all walked the streets of a small town or climbed on a ride at an amusement park and you've probably been on an island before or seen one or you know, one of those calendars on your wall with island pictures and you keep looking at it hoping to one day be able to take a vacation. And that's kind of the point, right? These liminal spaces are places we've been before, we've seen before, but something about them isn't quite right. The three places we are going to talk about today have this kind of normal yet abnormal feel to them. So without further ado, let's get started. Eleven miles south of Mexico City, you will find the floating gardens and canals of Xochimilco. Although beautiful and covered in foliage, these are not actually gardens, and they aren't actually floating, either. These are chinampas, artificial islands invented by the Aztecs and created by interweaving reeds with stakes beneath the surface of the water to make basically underwater fences. The interior of these fences would then be filled with soil and silt and vegetation all the way up until the top layer of soil was visible at the surface of the water. It's truly amazing. Because of the very nutrient-rich soil in the lakes and the availability of year-round water, these floating islands became perfect for farming. But one of these man-made islands appears to be farming something far more sinister, and its crop is plentiful. It's called Isla de la Monecas, or the Island of the Dolls. And as you approach it from the water, you can see the silhouette of a sliver of land with hundreds of tiny figures hanging from the branches of trees, swaying silently in the wind, at least until the sun goes down. And then people say the figures, which are actually dolls, begin to whisper to each other. Tourists and locals alike swear that the island is haunted, cursed, or both. Those passing on boats claim that the dolls will turn their heads to watch as they float by. Many locals will not step foot on the island, and those who have swear that they can hear the shadows talking and the little girls giggling in the darkness. Tour guides bringing visitors through the canals claim that they feel a strong pull 
coming from the island, like a siren calling a sailor to his death on the rocky shores. Today, the island is only inhabited by hundreds of decaying and dirty dolls, some missing limbs, some missing eyes, some missing their heads, but all of them share one thing in common. It really feels like they should not be there. So why are they there? Even before there was an island full of creepy hanging dolls, it was believed that this area was already cursed. According to Gerardo Ibarra, a co-founder of Ruta Origin, a sustainable travel company in Mexico, quote, During the time of Cortez, many people fled here to Xochimilco and hid on the canals. Many of these people were women and children hiding from the conquistadors, and many women killed themselves rather than be caught and raped by the Spanish, end quote. The island of the dolls was a place to run to, a place to disappear, a place to hide in from the world for years, which is exactly what it was used for by a man named Don Julian Santana Barrera, who was a native of Mexico City and who left his wife and family in the 1950s to make a home for himself on this isolated island. No one is quite sure why Don Julian chose to leave his entire life behind and live in solitude. Some people believe it was because he was very religious and spiritual, and so he felt that living a simple life closer to nature would also allow him to be closer to God. For a while, he lived a very quiet life, growing vegetables and fruit on the island and bringing his crops to Barrio de la Asuncion in order to sell. While he was there, Don Julian would enjoy a few glasses of pulque, which is a fermented alcoholic beverage made from agave sap, and he would also preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But this caused a lot of problems for him. This was the 1950s, and Mexico was and still is a very Catholic country. And during this time, it was unheard of that anyone should preach the gospel besides an anointed priest. So Don Julian got a lot of heat, and he even got beat up a couple of times, which only caused him to withdraw further and leave his isolated island home less and less. If this had been the end of Don Julian's story, most of the world would never have heard of him. We probably wouldn't be talking about him today. However, according to the legend, one day while he was out tending his crops and walking the one-acre island, Don Julian came upon the body of a young girl who had drowned while out swimming with her cousins. Don Julian pulled the child's body from the water and buried her on his island. But another body floated down the canals towards Don Julian's island not long after, a doll that Don Julian believed had belonged to the little girl. He felt that this doll must have been in the water with her when the current had overpowered her. Don Julian said a prayer for the girl's soul, and then he continued on with his simple and lonely life. But then trouble for Don Julian began. According to Rogelio Sanchez Santana, who is the current guardian of the island and the nephew of Don Julian, quote, The spirit of the girl was living in sorrow. In the mornings, Julian started to see ghosts, and one day he woke up to find that all his crops had died. He tried many things to improve his crops, but he couldn't because the spirit damaged them. He became more and more scared, end quote. Don Julian knew that he had to do something, and because he was very religious, he built an altar in his one-room cabin on the island, lighting a candle, saying a prayer, and hoping to appease the angry spirit of the drowned little girl. But the spirit continued to haunt Don Julian and the island. As a last resort, Don Julian took the girl's doll and hung it from a tree in an attempt to once again appease her spirit. And this actually seemed to calm the supernatural activity on the island for a little while. But after some time had passed, Don Julian found himself haunted again. He would be lying in his bed and hear footsteps slowly approaching on the creaking wood floor of his cabin. And then the whisper of a little girl right in his ear saying, I want my doll. Sometimes, in the dead of night, Don Julian could hear the soft sobbing of a child, but he couldn't identify where it was coming from. He would leave his cabin in the morning and find that the little girl's doll was hanging from a different tree than he had left her on the day before. It was enough to drive anyone mad, especially a person living alone on a small island with no electricity and no companionship. 
Something had to be done, and Don Julian thought he knew the answer. For the next 50 years, Don Julian collected over 1,000 dolls and placed them all over his island. He would float through the canals on his boat. He would go to various towns and search through dumpsters and trash bins, and eventually the dolls started coming to him. Locals would know when he was coming through, and they would give Don Julian dolls in return for the fruits and vegetables that he was growing on his island. As time went on and people nearby heard what Don Julian was doing, they would travel to his island with dolls and leave them for him. Today, the dolls have taken over an otherwise abandoned island. Everywhere you look, there are dolls hanging from trees, strung on clotheslines, nailed to buildings, propped up inside and outside of Don Julian's original cabin. Sometimes they're just sitting on the ground in the forest, staring up at you with glassy, dead eyes. And I think we can all admit, no matter how non-superstitious you are, no matter how brave you are, no matter how many times you sit through an entire haunted hayride, stoic, never jumping once, an island filled with hanging dolls is pretty creepy all on its own. But it's actually the state that the dolls are in which will truly send a chill down your spine. Even if the dolls started out in perfect condition, they didn't stay that way, exposed to the elements for years and years and years. Like I said, some are missing arms or legs, some are missing eyes, one eye or both, some don't have heads, some don't have bodies. Sometimes it's just dolls' heads hanging. But all of the dolls look like they've been forgotten and left behind. Their faces are smudged with dirt. Their clothes are dirty and torn. If there was ever a true, real-life island of the misfit toys, it's this one. And some of the dolls look as if they've been posed and cared for in a way. Some of them have shiny plastic bracelets on their little doll wrists or colorful clips adorning their hair. Some look as if they've been ripped apart and sewn back together. Some of the dolls are haphazardly dressed, one wearing just a skirt and the other wearing a shirt, as if they realized they only had one complete outfit between the two of them, and they were like, well, this is the best we can do. Others look as if they've been dressed and styled carefully, with little patent leather shoes and little socks with tiny bows on them and little doll skirts and matching blouses. It looks as if they were dressed the way a parent would dress a child before school in the morning. But there's one thing that all the dolls share in common. We see them with our eyes, but our brains tell us they shouldn't be there. When I see pictures of this island, I recoil because it looks like hundreds of little babies hanging from trees forever cursed to swing in the breeze on this lonely island, which may not be too lonely because as legend goes, at night these dolls come alive. They climb down from their perches, they run around together, they talk to each other, they giggle. And like I said, even during the day, when people walk through this island, because it is open as a tourist attraction if you ever wanted to tour it, they say that the baby doll's heads will turn to look at them. Or the eyes of a baby doll who had previously looked as if she was sleeping would suddenly slide open and stare. We'll never truly know what was going on in the mind of Don Julian when he decided to decorate his island in this way. It seems that he truly thought that presenting the spirit of the little drowned girl with a new doll would keep her happy for a short time. It would keep her from destroying his crops and, you know, scaring the shit out of him at night. So he would bring a doll and another doll and another doll, just trying to buy himself time. What we do know is that over time, Don Julian became a minor celebrity and people began traveling to the area just to see his infamous island. It became so popular to the point where there's copycat islands of... It became so popular that there's actually copycat islands now because, you know, people want to go to this area in Mexico. They want to go there for a lot of reasons. There's these beautiful colored boats and you kind of go down the canals. They call it the Venice of Mexico. And there's mariachi bands and food. And it's this entire like festival experience that is, you know, a great, a great experience. But they want to see the island of the dolls, even if they don't go on the island, because a lot of people don't want to go on the island, but they want to float past the island and see this weird, bizarre sight for themselves. So Don Julian and his island became very popular, and Don Julian would welcome tourists and visitors to his home with open arms. He would cheerfully give them tours, and he even began collecting newspaper clippings that would mention his islands and his dolls. 
Now, Don Julian's favorite doll was reportedly named Monak, and he ended up building another little hut specifically for Monak and some of his other favorite dolls, which he would dress up and accessorize. Some people report that he would care for the dolls as if they were children. He would talk to them sweetly and sing to them when they were upset. Don Julian had another favorite doll, but this one he kept in his own home, and her name was Augustina. When he found Augustina, Don Julian was struck by the resemblance of the doll to the little girl who had drowned. So he took special care with Augustina because he felt that the spirit of the little girl would go in to Augustina. And reportedly, the reason that Don Julian was so attentive to some of his dolls was that he believed these were the dolls that the spirit of the little girl would possess. However, many people who knew Don Julian, they actually wondered if it was he who'd been possessed by the despondent child spirit because they said that he seemed moved by some unseen force to collect these dolls. No matter how many he came in possession of, it was never Never enough. And a lot of people think, why would a grown man do that? That seems like something a little girl would do. However, many people, including some members of his own family, they believe that Don Julian was mentally ill and that he never found the body of a little girl, that he had imagined her or fabricated her completely. And to this day, the drowning of a little girl in the canals at this time has never been confirmed. And I do think it's strange that the girl's family would just let some strange man bury their daughter's body on his island. So I think it's certainly a possibility that this never happened, or if it did happen, nobody ever came looking for her, but that also seems highly unlikely. I don't think he fabricated it to be malicious. I think if Don Julian fabricated it, it was because he was lonely and he let his imagination get away with him, and maybe he needed something to give him a purpose, and this was what he settled on. Whether this little girl existed or not, Don Julian devoted his entire life to her, a life that would end in 2001 when he was 80 years old. On the morning of April 21st, Don Julian's nephew, Anastasio, came to the island to help his uncle plant some pumpkins, and they decided to go fishing together on the banks of the canal, as they usually did. While they were fishing, Don Julian began to sing this haunting song, and when Anastasio asked, what was the song? His uncle told him he was singing to keep the spirits of the mermaids at bay because they'd been calling to him, gleefully beckoning him to join them in the water. As Don Julian continued to fish and sing, Anastasio left to get some pumpkin planting done. But when he returned an hour later, he was horrified to discover his uncle face down in the water of the canal, drowned in, reportedly, exactly the same place he had claimed to have found the body of the little girl so many years before. Although Don Julian was reported to have drowned after having heart failure, which we can all admit is a very natural cause, he was an older man, he may have had a heart attack and fallen in the water and drowned, many people still believe that the spirits on that island who had haunted him for decades were finally able to lure him to his watery death. Some even say that the spirit of the girl dragged him into the water. Maybe that's because as this little girl was Don Julian's only companion, Don Julian was her only companion, and she finally wanted them to be together for real. Ever since then, visitors to the island claim there is still the spirit of a young girl roaming through the trees, and she's joined by the spirit of an old man, Don Julian himself. Don Julian's nephew Anastasio took the island over, and when he died in 2019, the island passed to his nephew, Rogelio Santana. Santana and his family do not live on the island. I do not blame them. They actually occupy their own island about 20 minutes away, but he will go there, you know, on the boat and keep an eye on it and give tours and things like that. But whether you think this island is actually haunted or cursed or not, you couldn't pay me enough money to live on an island full of creepy hanging dolls. You could not. I will not do it. I don't even know if I would spend a night there. I will be brave and be like, oh, yeah, I'll spend the night there. I could lie to you guys and say I would be brave and I would spend the night there, but between you and me, nah. However, the Island of the Dolls has become a popular and lucrative tourist attraction, though many superstitious individuals refuse to even go near the island. Once again, they claim that they feel an energy pulling them towards it when they float by. 
Now, there are a lot of people who feel that the whole thing is just a money-making scheme and there's nothing spooky about the island and there's certainly no spirits hanging around. But I know that the people who live in Mexico, especially the ones I talk to, they definitely feel like there's something there. And there's no reason that something can't be both a tourist attraction and a deeply haunted and dark place at the same time. Japan is an archipelago of 6,835 islands, a place that has moved into the future but is still tightly tied to the past. Japan has given us the cherry blossom, the koi fish, the samurai, and karaoke. It is such a beautiful place with a riveting history and a vibrant culture, but all of that is in jeopardy due to the nation's aging and shrinking population. Japan has the highest proportion of elderly citizens of any country in the world, and according to 2014 estimates, about 38% of the Japanese population is above the age of 60 and 29% are 65 or older. It is expected that between the years 2010 and 2060, the percentage of Japanese citizens over the age of 75 will double from 11% to 27 percent. Now you may think, what's the big deal? This isn't a big deal. Old people are great. Maybe you add a few more minutes to your work commute to make up for all the slow driving senior citizens. But it's not that simple. As the number of older people in Japan rises, the number of younger people decreases just as rapidly. In 1960, 40 percent of the population were aged 19 years old or younger. But it is projected that by 2060, that number will decline to just 13 percent. A baby boom is a period marked by a significant increase in birth rate, and Japan has had two. Their first occurred after World War II, and their second took place in the early to mid-70s. But Japan also has a very high life expectancy, 81 years old for men and 88 years for women. And that's drastically up from the period of World War II, when the average life expectancy for men was 50 years old and 54 years old for women. After that second baby boom, Japan's fertility rate plummeted below the replacement threshold, and it reached a historic low in 2005. This is due to multiple factors, including later and fewer marriages, because the Japanese people are very traditional and you don't typically see many children being born out of wedlock. In fact, in 2015, one in 10 Japanese adults in their 30s reported having no sexual experience. Women began pursuing higher education and careers, and they put starting a family off. And many young people face financial insecurity because of a lack of jobs, so they felt it would be irresponsible to bring children into the world that they weren't able to afford to care for. And because everyone has to work so hard and work such long hours, they report feeling too physically and mentally exhausted to even venture into the dating world a feeling I can completely relate to. If I wasn't married, I would not be dating. It seems completely exhausting. So this means that babies are not being born fast enough to replace an aging population. And many young people of Japan are leaving the country to seek employment opportunities elsewhere. The Japanese government has enacted policies to encourage population growth since the decline in population has impacted the nation's economy, as well as threatened the strength of its military, which makes sense if you think about it, because... Young people are the ones who are signing up to the military. There's not a lot of young people left in Japan. This is leaving them weak economically and military-wise. But one remote mountain village called Nagaro, located in the Aya Valley on the island of Shikoku, has taken matters into their own hands. Shikoku is the smallest and the least populated of Japan's four major islands, but during the 1950s and 1960s, the area was bustling with activity. Road constructions and dams were built for hydroelectric plants, but once the dams were completed, many people left because the water had actually been diverted away from the village, and those who stayed, which were roughly 300 people, they had to operate their own pumps in order to bring in water so that they could grow fruits and vegetables and food. But as the years went on, more and more residents packed up and left. By January of 2015, only 35 people remained. This fell to 30 people in August of 2016 and fell again to 27 people by the end of 2019. It has been 20 years since a child was born in Nagaro, 
and the youngest person who lives there now is 40 years old. In 2012, after the last two students completed sixth grade, the elementary school was shut down and abandoned. And although Nagaro used to have a medical clinic, a diner, and even a pachinko parlor, none of that remains. The closest grocery store or hospital is an hour and a half away, and Nagaro doesn't even have one shop left. But if you drove through this tiny village, you might think it was a bustling place. You would see some women tending to their gardens. You'd see children fill a tiny classroom. Construction workers stopped for a cigarette break on the side of the road. A father pulling his children in a wagon. Two old men sitting on a bench together, waiting for a bus that stopped running a long time ago. If you took a closer look, you would realize that these are not people at all. They are life-sized dolls. Dolls that outnumber the real people in Nagaro 10 to 1. These dolls are the work of a woman named Tsukimi Ayano, who left the town when she was 10 and when her father took a job working for a food company in Osaka, Japan's third largest city. Like so many others, she and her family left the tiny village because there were no opportunities for young working people there, and Ayano would eventually meet a man, get married, and raise two children. After her father retired from his job, he returned to the village of Nagaro to help care for his sick father-in-law and to nurse his own wife through kidney failure. And in 2002, Ayano also returned because now it was her duty to care for her elderly father, who at that time was the oldest resident of Nagaro. While she lived there, Ayano saw many people that she grew to know and care for leave. Some people moved away for better opportunities, and some passed away. And she began to feel that the village, which had been her childhood home, was very empty and lonely. One day, she was planting some radishes and some peas in the field in front of her father's house, and the birds kept swooping down and eating the seeds before they could take root. So, Tsukimi Ayano created a scarecrow, modeled after her own father, and she put it up. The scarecrow was very effective at keeping the hungry, thieving birds at bay. Not only that, it had been fun to make, and she felt from a distance the scarecrow looked like a real person, so she made four more scarecrows. This time, the dolls were in the shape of four women, hard at work, weeding the field. Ayano became amused when a few passing travelers stopped to ask the dolls for directions, and so she began making more and more of these life-sized dolls, these scarecrows, and she set up a doll-making workshop in the village's abandoned nursery school. Using materials like wooden sticks and newspapers for the bodies and elastic fabric and wool for the faces and hair, it takes Ayano about three days to make a complete doll, and she even applies makeup to add color to the cheeks and lips, adding to the realistic element of these silent villagers. She's become very adept at, you know, fine-tuning the faces to give these very minute expressions, these very realistic expressions. Ayano was encouraged when she began to see the few residents who remained in Nagaro interacting with the dolls on a daily basis, saying, good morning, or how are you today, as they passed. Eventually, Ayano began to model the dolls after people who died. She keeps a doll that looks like her grandmother in the passenger seat of her car, and the doll keeps her company on the long drive to pick up groceries each week. When one of her neighbors passed away, Ayano created a doll that looked like her neighbor, who was also her friend, so that they could continue their daily visits and chats. Not only does she make new dolls, but she maintains the existing ones, performing repairs when needed and replacing them when they've been exposed to the elements for too long. It's supposed to be a nice gesture, and I'm sure the people living there appreciate it. But from an outsider's perspective, it does feel a bit eerie, especially when you step into the village's abandoned elementary school and see 12 child-sized dolls facing towards a chalkboard that has one chilling question written on it. Where are the living? On the sunny tropical island of Singapore in Southeast Asia, you can visit Ha Par Villa, a theme park that showcases more than 1,000 statues and 150 life-sized dioramas, many of which are inspired by Chinese folklore and legend. Now, reportedly, the park was designed to be a fun place to teach children about Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism, but it has become nightmare fuel for the many children who have made their way through the massive front gates. 
and today it is considered to be one of the most haunted places in the country. Originally called Tiger Balm Gardens, Ha Par Villa was built by prominent businessman and philanthropist Ah Boon Ha. His father was Ah Chu Kin, the son of a Chinese herbalist who left southern China to set up his own apothecary in Rangoon, where he went on to have three sons, Ah Boon Ha, or Gentle Tiger, Ah Boon Liang, or Gentle Dragon, and Ah Boon Par, or Gentle Leopard. Sadly, by 1908, both Ah Boon Liang and his father had passed away, and the family business, which was the apothecary, was left to the two remaining brothers, Boon Ha and Boon Par. Together, using their father's recipes, the two brothers created a well-known and well-loved analgesic balm that was said to heal anything that ailed you from mosquito bites to sore throats. When they showed it to the world in 1924, they called it Tiger Balm, after the elder brother, Boon Ha, which once again meant gentle tiger. Boon Ha became well-known as someone who donated money to charities and schools. He was kind of extra. He was kind of a showman. He was really focused on his image and the company's image while he his brother was behind the scenes building the business and worrying about the business aspects. And Boon Ha also built several mansions in Singapore, Hong Kong, and Fujian. The Singapore residence was built on a prime hilltop plot of land overlooking the Pasar Panjang Harbor, and it was considered to be an architectural delight for the time, featuring a huge circular motif with seven domes and gold-plated ceilings. Now, in the sprawling gardens that surrounded the mansion, Boon Ha personally oversaw the creation of several fixtures that reflected famous Chinese figures and legends. And in 1937, he opened the gardens to the public because he was concerned that the young people of the day had become detached from basic morality and values, you know, like don't lie and treat your elders with respect. Now, at the start of World War II, the mansion and the gardens were abandoned, and the two brothers fled Singapore, at which point Japan took control of the land, finding it to be a strategically important place where they could watch for ships at sea from the excellent vantage point at the top of the hill. And during the war, much of the mansion and the gardens were destroyed. But Boon Ha returned after the war, and he rebuilt the gardens with the help of Boon Par's son, because sadly, Boon Par had died in 1944, and his older brother would follow him in 1954. And in 1985, the Singapore Tourism Board took control of the property and expanded the park to five times its size, adding more dioramas, adding more sculptures, and adding Disney-style rides so that they could market this area as a ticketed attraction. But it never really caught on. And in 1986, they tried to modernize the park further using animatronics because animatronics have always made things less creepy, said no one ever. For the most part, many of the attractions inside Ha Par Villa simply border on creepy, especially if you don't understand the cultural or religious significance behind them. You know, like for me, I think it's creepy. But if you were a person who grew up with these legends and this folklore, you would probably just think it was completely normal. So there's things like crabs with human heads, blue sea monsters coiling out of the walls, giant Buddhas who I, I think don't look super friendly in my opinion, but that's just my opinion. They are giant. There's white snakes with the heads of women, things like that. Once again, I think it's very cool. I think a lot of people would be a little unsettled by it. But in my opinion, I like being unsettled. I like these creepy things. But if you had grown up learning these legends and hearing these stories, it might not seem very scary to you. However, the main attraction is the gruesome Ten Courts of Hell, or the Hell's Museum, as it is currently known. And it does not matter who you are, how you grew up, where you're from, you will be terrified in this place. Terrified. And that's kind of the point, which doesn't seem too fun for me. Like, if I'm going to a theme park or an amusement park, I'm ready for a day of fun. And this whole attraction, the whole point of this attraction is to terrify the living hell out of young children. So in Chinese mythology, when a person dies, they arrive in the first court of hell. And here in the first court of hell, nothing too scary happens. You're just going to be judged by King King Wang, who will meticulously assess each person's past deeds. 
Now, if a person's deemed to be good and virtuous, then they're all set. They have nothing to worry about. They get to cross over a golden bridge into paradise. But if you're walking through Ha Para Villa's courts of hell, that's not where you're headed. Nobody goes in there and they're like, I'm great. <laughs> Let me walk over the golden bridge into paradise. No, instead, you will take the path of the evil and the wicked, and you will be dragged to the appropriate court or to more than one appropriate court to receive the punishment which fits your sins. Most of the park attractions are out in the open, but your journey through the Ten Courts of Hell will bring you into the cavernous darkness of a tunnel that leads you into different caves, each cave representing the torture that awaits sinners, dimly lit with strains of creepy music and gruesome three-dimensional scenes set up to remind children to behave themselves or else. And when I say gruesome scenes, understand that all of these things I'm going to describe to you, all of these punishments, they are acted out in these, like, dioramas and sculptures and stuff in vivid detail. So if it is decided in the first court that you are an evil sinner, you will move on to the second court of hell. And in the second court of hell, thieves and violent people are burned alive in a volcano, while gamblers and the corrupt are exposed to extreme cold temperatures. If you're lucky, you get to do both. If you stole in life, you'll be forced to kneel on steel granules for all of eternity, or at least until they've decided you're repentant enough, and incompetent physicians and matchmakers will be repeatedly beaten. In the third court, those who were ungrateful in life or who didn't respect their elders or who escaped from prison, they will be punished by having their hearts ripped from their chests by gleeful imps. So these imps are like little demons and they just seem really happy to be hurting you all the time, which makes it worse. You know, little demons, scary enough, little demons who just are very excited Excited to cause you pain and, and suffering, terrifying. Also in this court, you have drug traffickers, drug addicts, tomb robbers, and those who encouraged crime and civil unrest. And these people are tied to a copper pillar and grilled alive. In the fourth court, those who conducted their business dishonestly, those who were cruel to animals or their friends, are ground to a bloody pulp in a giant mortar and pestle. In this court, there's also a large grindstone that's reserved for those who are not loyal to their parents or siblings, and they will also be ground to a bloody pulp. Moving on to the fifth court, a giant mountain of sharp knives awaits those who committed crimes, including murder for money and money lenders who charged exorbitant rates. I'm kind of okay with that. The sixth court of hell shows those who possessed pornography being sawn in half. The same fate awaits you if you've ever wasted food, broken a law, or misused a book. Kidnappers and people who swear are relegated to the tree of knives to be skewered for all of time over and over again. You heard me right, kidnappers and those who swear. So I'm going to be up on that knife tree next to kidnappers in the ever after. What have I done wrong with my life? The seventh court of hell is reserved for those who used their words for evil instead of good. Liars, gossips, and those who deal in rumors will have their tongues nailed to the floor or simply clipped off by the imps who are all too happy to deal out this torture. And next to them, a big vat of boiling oil awaits the rapists and the murderers. I think they're getting off easy. They need to be, you know, ground to a pulp in the mortar and pestle, in my opinion. And then maybe the oil next. In the eighth court of hell, people who have harmed others to benefit themselves are chopped into pieces, and those who neglected their parents have their stomachs cut open and their intestines pulled out. People who have cheated on tests and exams also suffer this same fate because it is considered a dishonor to one's family if you cheat on an exam. In the ninth court of hell, robbers, murderers, and rapists continue to be punished by being stripped and dismembered. And if you neglected the old or the weak in your life, you will be slowly crushed to death by massive boulders. And finally, the tenth and final court brings an end to the torture and punishment, and those who make it there are considered redeemed and ready for reincarnation. I think we can all agree, Ha Par Villa is one of a kind. And the fact that it's expected that children will go through this whole attraction 
is a little disturbing to me. One person remembered their childhood experience in the Ten Courts of Hell, saying, quote, I was brought here by my aunt as a punishment. So imagine walking through the gates of hell as a kid whose only crime was being hella cute with a hint of mischievousness. Needless to say, it was a unique way of learning a lesson or two, end quote. But Stephanie Lay and so many others feel that the terror of Ha Par Villa goes beyond the fabricated fear factor. She first visited the park when she was 10, and she claims that she immediately knew it was haunted and cursed, saying, quote, I knew it from the moment I arrive, when I watch the snake looming over the entrance. I know it now, two decades and thousands of kilometers later. There are books dedicated to its hauntings, websites and message boards and strangers on the street. The park is haunted. You know that. End quote. Now, rumor has it. Oh, rumor has it. Damn, I'm going to the courts of hell. I'm a rumor monger. Rumor has it that when the park first opened as a theme park, strange things began to happen at sunset. The dead bodies of stray cats and dogs began turning up at the park entrance, and the guards who patrol all night have heard screams coming from the courts of hell as actual souls go through punishment after punishment. Now, it is said that the ten courts of hell are the actual portal to hell, and the legend claims that when the park was newly built, a local witch doctor would sneak in late at night to confer with the spirits of the other side. He had chosen the location of the park because it was far away from the hustle and bustle of the city, and he was drawn to the energy of the place. This witch doctor was very powerful, and he served many clients who demanded things like love potions or the winning numbers for the toto draw. But in order to provide these things, the witch doctor had to request help from the spirit world. He would call them to him, get what he needed, and then leave. But the spirits he had brought over remained, and eventually they possessed the many statues and integrated themselves into the park attractions, especially the Ten Courts of Hell. It has been said that the darkest, strongest, most vile spirits were attracted to the courts because they resembled the place where they'd been called from, the place where they belonged. When the Singapore government took over, it has been said that they removed many of the most scary statues, which had become warped as the evil spirits settled deeper into them. The order was given to tear the statues down and then use a hill behind the park as a dumping ground for them. One night, a guard was patrolling the entrance when he heard dogs barking. There was no moon out that night and it was very dark, so he firmly held a flashlight high in his hand so that he could see what was causing all the commotion as he approached the front entrance. He claimed that as he got closer to the gate, he saw a pack of dogs cowering and whimpering in fear, and in the dim light, the guard saw the gigantic tail of a snake slithering away. In shock, he looked up to find that the giant serpent that graced the entrance gate was gone. He resigned the next day, but other guards made reports to their superiors claiming the statues were coming alive at night. And the implication is that this giant serpent at the entrance of the park was coming alive at night and killing stray dogs and cats and then leaving their bodies at the gate when he went back to his perch. So all of these guards at night are making all of these reports of all these creepy things happening. And reportedly, the officials made these reports disappear because they wanted to avoid scaring potential tourists. One guard spoke to a journalist requesting to remain anonymous, and he said that after about a month of working at the park, he became accustomed to the insane amount of supernatural activity happening there, especially around the dumping ground where the possessed statues had been left to rot. Some guards believe that the statues are actually dead human beings dipped in wax, Maybe those who could not be redeemed after going through the ten courts of hell and who were lost causes. Sometimes the guards will leave offerings like food or cigarettes for these statues, a silent plea to be left alone. But not many people have gone to Harpar Villa and felt completely okay with the experience. It does have a creepy vibe. It does have a cursed vibe. And that could just be because of the ten courts of hell, and that could be because... It's a very terrifying attraction, and young children have these, like, nightmares and maybe negative memories from going through the Ten Courts of Hell as children, and it's almost like this shared negative memory of the place. Who knows? But 
Will I be going there? If I'm ever in Singapore, yes, I will. But once again, will I ever be there at night? Will you ever catch me like applying for a job as a night guard at Hop Har Villa? Nope. Not, not ever once will I be there after dark. Nope. So that concludes our video on what I believe to be the three most disturbing places in the world. Now, while I was going through my research, I found a bunch more places like this, but I just couldn't fit them into the video. So if you liked this video and you want to see another one like it, let me know in the comment section. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, share it if you think it's worth sharing, and subscribe for more content like this. Halloween's going on for a month and it's going to be a great one. Also, don't forget to check out Native. Link is in the description box. Don't forget to check out my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host every week with Derek Levasseur, who's a retired police detective and also a winner of Big Brother. We do a lot of great cases over on Crime Weekly. You can listen anywhere. You get your audio podcast and we also have a YouTube channel. All of those links are in the description box. Also, don't forget to check out our coffee company, Criminal Coffee Company. We make amazing coffee. We have a light roast, a medium roast, and a dark roast. The dark roast is my favorite because I do like an intense coffee, but they're all very good. Once again, links in the description box. Thank you guys so much for being here with me. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and stay spooky, and I will see you very, very soon. Bye. <gasps>